Welcome to Die Hard on a Blank, the podcast where we explore the influence of Die Hard on action cinema, one action movie at a time. I'm Philip Gawthorne, and with me as always is Liam Billingham, and today's film is The River Wild. It's Die Hard in a dinghy. It's Die Hard on a boat. It's we we debated this one for a while, and <laughs> Phil wanted me to go with Die Hard on a dinghy. So we're going. I'm a fan of alliteration. I'm all love, about alliteration. You're a writer. You love, love an alliteration. Bit, love a little bit of alliteration. Love a little alliteration. You know what else I love? Guests, special guests. Our special guest. Our, our special, special guest. I love our special guest too. Our spe- my our special guest is one of my absolute favorite people, and he's in the dinghy with us. He is, in my opinion, the king of movie podcasting. Shh, he's shh. made some of the great shows. And he's here with us right now, Blake Howard, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, stop, Blake. stop. <laughs> you stop. You, you stop. stop. You stop. stop. Oh, I my can't goodness. handle these many compliments. Throw an insult at me, for God's sake. Uh, <laughs> I don't have any. You put oh, me on the God spot. Damn it. God damn for- it. Thank you, gentlemen, for inviting me along to your little, uh, your little diehard on a blank, I mean, incredible cachet of movies um some more tenuously connected to die Hard than others but i'm really stoked to be here for the river wild um i i I have a huge affection and love for this movie and i was so excited when i looked at your little list of movies that you're covering i was like i really want to do that one i love that movie so much i have so much time for it i love curtis hansen i love the actors marilla's action star gimme love it yes great has it always been a big movie in your life or was it something that you've just like dip in and out of what's your relationship with, with it over time? Cause you really, this was an interesting one that you were like, I want to do that one, you know? So I'm really interested to unpack like were that what's, why are you so passionate about this movie? Well, so Phil, when I was growing up, my brother worked for a video at the time, a video VHS and DVD distribution warehouse. And one of the perks of his job was that they used to send out, I know this is going to sound really funny, and old, so I apologize to all the people listening. This is a 35 plus in the right dude place. show. This is yeah, okay. okay. So <laughs> he works for that warehouse, here. and what they used to do at video stores is they would send out time code videotapes to the video stores as like a perk to say, hey, like how many copies of X do you want? So they'd send out. You know, not everything was Jurassic Park that, you know, which everyone bought. It would be like, okay, what do you want? And so as a perk, my brother would get the time code videotapes. And so we had a really amazing collection of movies from really 1992 up to like 2001 for Warner Brothers, Paramount, uh, Village Roadshow Pictures, New Line, Miramax, like like everything in that period, I almost had every single thing that was released. We had hundreds and hundreds of VHS tapes. And one of them was River Wild. And so I had a copy of it. I watched it and I immediately, like I was, I don't know whether I was the right age or whatever, or maybe it was like, the right adventurous sort of thing. I was a very outgoing kid. Like we lived near the ocean. I used to kayak. I used to sail. I surfed, you know, did surf life saving, played sport, like very active. And I, but I also used to watch a ridiculously unhealthy amount of movies. And this was one of them, <laughs> and, you know, and, and, and I, I loved it so much. And it kind of, for most folks, like if they, they didn't get grabbed by, Ooh, sick, a Meryl Streep action movie. Like no one was like doing that in my local hometown. They had no, no one had hired this movie that I knew, but I'd watched it like 15 times. And so I really loved it. And I watched it a lot when I was growing up. And then it was only kind of recently sort of around, it was like osmosis. It was around your show. And it was like one of those, like, I don't usually like to buy stuff on, if I have to buy stuff, I do like buying it on like iTunes or whatever. And they had a special of like nineties and they were going through every single year and they're only like five bucks for all these movies. And I was like, okay, well, you know, I'm, I might check out what they've got and see if there's any bargains. And the river wild was one of the first ones in the 1994 aisle. Mm. If you like, my son calls them aisles, go to that aisle. Um, and I went click and I was like, yes, that's a hundred percent purchase bought it. And I was just so pleased that it like, it totally held up. Oh yeah, and, and, and yeah. So I've had I've had a long relationship with it, and much like anything that I know, all the guys, all, all, all the guests that you guys have had, and you guys particularly, it's like this movie just makes all movies today look like a bag of shit. Like it looks <laughs> amazing. <laughs> it looks amazing, it and does. you're like, and you're like, production value, stunts, yeah, the cast. Even though it's a small cast, it's like the, everyone's a heavy hitter. I was just like blown away and so, and continue to be, I, I think it's a really like as, and without, with no shade, 
like one of the best sort of three and a half star movies you could ever hope for, right? Like yep. just so consumable, so rewatchable. I don't know what I want to watch. River Wild, yeah, bang, sorted, done. Great acting, good little bit of drama. Curtis Hansen, who's our guy, um, you know, Meryl, David Strathairn, looking like a snack. Um, and uh, yeah, oh my just really- God. We'll get to that. Um, so yeah, no, handsome. Just, so handsome. So handsome. Everyone's like Kevin Bacon. I'm like, get out of here. It's all get out of here. It's Strathern. Uh, uh, but yeah, so no, that's that. I've just loved this movie for like decades. And only in the last year or so, I think, whenever that recent sale happened, did I reacquaint myself with it. And I was really pleased to do so. So it's, it sort of all happened at the same time. I want to ask you, Liam, about your your experience with it, but but just just picking up on that on that point, I I, rem- I haven't seen this for a long time. I brief very briefly, I saw it when it came out with my parents. Funnily enough, most of these movies I would go see just with my dad, but this one my mum wanted to go see as well, partly because she is a huge David Strathairn fan and a huge well, John well, Sayles well. fan. Who isn't? Um, <laughs> but what was funny about what you just said was, as I was rewatching, I had I don't think I'd actually watched it since it came out, but I remember loving it. But as it started and the Jerry Goldsmith score came in, I found myself like getting very moved. And that's uh, partly because I haven't slept in three years on account of (laughs) being the parent of a toddler. So my emotions are always at the surface, but I found myself just thinking, movies, movies, (laughs) man. Like this, the old school clash, universal, Jerry Goldsmith, the way it shot, the light glimmering off the Boston River. And I was like, oh gosh, inject this into my eyeballs and soul. I love this movie. Liam, you had an interesting story connection with it as well, right? When you first saw it, you saw it with a buddy. Or yeah. I mean, I was thinking back, I think I saw this, you know, the, the demand to see a movie opening night in 1994 wasn't quite the same as it is now, right. To avoid the spoiler culture that, that we live in, but definitely saw it early in the run. I have like a distinct memory of seeing it with my friend, Brian Fahey, who I needed to shout out because half the movies on this list I saw with him for the first time. And he has not <laughs> been name dropped. And I know he listened recently and is probably waiting to hear, but like basically my brother, we saw this together with, I believe my dad, probably his dad. And then I remember watching it with with my whole family and just the the thing that's burned into my memory in this movie is actually how much you hate Kevin Bacon in mm. this movie like he mm. is just absolutely incredible and I you know I hadn't seen it in a couple decades and then I revisiting it last week for this similarly it was like three bucks there's a weird sale happening on amazon in the u.s around this too where you can get like yeah. I got, you know get like speed for three dollars or whatever uh yeah i think this movie is is almost a forgotten classic like almost and you know we're all friends with chris tapley here we love that guy and yeah, i, I feel chris. like someone needs to do like a a river wild deep dive like someone needs to do like an oral history i mean it is an interesting one because it's a fulcrum point in in cinema and in action cinema, you know, as a Meryl Streep action movie, that is a gigantic kind of, that's a that's a significant moment in the history of cinema. We'll talk more about it, but why don't we just put this in context with a few quick um, facts. Um, the River Wild had its wide release on September 30th of 1994, which was one week after our last film, Terminal Velocity. Um, crazy oh. as we talked about how quickly these films were another one out. I had on Such VHS big VHS movie oh yeah oh yeah <laughs> it's actually big an iconic VHS. the the box for that movie is weirdly iconic for a movie that is not as remembered but like the image of that movie is like sort of important. defines the video store I just feel like yeah our extent, cultural yeah. memory of this stuff is so defined yeah. by the analog it's you know yeah. it's you know the pre-digital world of these things when things had footprints so we're just over six years now after Die Hard's release. Um, this film was written by Dennis O'Neill, directed by the great uh, Curtis Hansen, who we're going to talk more about. Uh, it, of course, stars Meryl Streep, Kevin Bacon, David Strathairn, Joseph Mazzello, and John C. Riley. John C. Riley. In an, uh, mm. one of his early. Uh, I forgot scene he was in this parts. until I turned yeah. it on. I had no memory. Yeah, I didn't remember it was him either, but he's just so, I mean, that role is so thankless and he does so much. Oh, he makes it so dimensional, yeah. That's, that's how you know he is he is one of the best actor. of his generation, yeah, for sure. On an estimated budget of $45 million, it grossed $94.2 million. And this, I thought, was really notable uh, for a quote-unquote kind of, you know, action thriller Streep and Bacon both received Golden Globe nominations for their work in this movie, which I think is, you know, just worth worth commenting on. Um, now, 
despite outward appearances, you, because people might be thinking again, you know, you just alluded to this fact, Blake, like some of the films that we've done are very, very clearly die hard, you know, die hard on a blank scenario. Some of them might seem like a bit of a, bit of a stretch, but I would suggest to you that this film does contain quite a lot of die hard DNA. <laughs> despite its outward appearances this this is a classic die hard scenario right you've got you know we we've often we did we stopped doing it in every episode because i think people know what we're doing by now but a, the die hard scenario is bad guys take over a blank and it's up to one person to fight back or a group of people to fight back that's exactly what this movie is it's bad guys take over the river slash the raft and it's up to meryl streep and her family to find a way to fight back um, it also focuses on a wife and husband in a troubled marriage who are emotionally estranged at the beginning of the film, again, just like Die Hard and True Lies that we talked about as, uh, recently as well. I think it's also, the other thing that struck me watching it again was like how much character development and relationship building there is in the movie before the conflict kicks in, which is also a lot like Die Hard. 42 minutes before we see see Chekhov's gun right and 50 minutes before it's pulled in anger um and it also relies on a lot of like improvisational tactics and kind of you know jerry-rigged booby traps and things like that to kind of you know thwart the enemy so I was actually quite um yeah I, I, again under the microscope it was actually quite a lot of diehard DNA can I can there. I pose a slight uh, uh please adjustment to your theory please I actually think this is more diehard with a vengeance because the Meryl character of Gail has already been down the river. Like that feels like Die Hard. Like she already went down the river. It's like, oh, you remember that thing in Nakatomi Towers, you know, a few years ago. So she's already been down the river and this is her again. So this for me, when I was looking at your show format, I was like, well, the Die Hard DNA for me is actually it's Die Hard with a Vengeance. She's already been down the river. So she she has done this before and she was younger and maybe we have prequel had, anyone the yeah, gauntlet so, yeah so the let's, like let's CGI Meryl's face no, no <laughs> let's no, get that uncanny we not, no we get her daughter, daughter. you get her daughter to do it she's no, an actress no, we are not we're not doing that we're <laughs> okay, not CGIing fine. anything listen I've, it's, I've had enough okay guys I've had enough with the Don't CGI leave. I'm just kidding I'm just we kidding. Hollywood hacks we're over here like how can we make money we need this? IP we need IP <laughs> we need IP we need IP and I love that I love that needing IP means that they think people are so dumb that another actor can't do it. It's like, just hire an actor, for God's sake. And $45 million wouldn't get catering on a contemporary movie. How the hell did this movie do what it did for $45 million? I mean, even scaled up to our time, that's still like under $100 million, all practical, shot on film, on location, craziness. Yeah. No, but that's, so I've always thought of the Die Hard with a Vengeance. That's uh, really good, actually. Yeah. That's yeah, really, really, really good. It's a really interesting point. We're gonna we'll dig more into that um, when we move into our anatomy of an action movie section after this very quick break. We are back, and we're gonna get into our section anatomy of an action movie, where we list the tenants. We live in a twilight world that make up an action film. So the premise of this film is that. Married couple Gail and Tom Hartman, played by Streep and Strathairn, are in the middle of a relationship crisis and on the verge of separation when they take their young son Rourke on a whitewater rafting trip for his birthday. However, their vacation turns into a nightmare when they encounter Wade and Terry, played by Bacon and Riley, two criminals on the lam who take the family hostage and force them to aid their escape through the notoriously treacherous Idaho rapids. So it's interesting, you know, we'll have this debate now, right, with the Die Hard versus Die Hard with Avengers. For me, my sort of theory was this was sort of the the Die Hardification of the yuppie in peril thriller, right, that were, that were popping yeah. off at this time. And Curtis Hansen had directed two of them already, Bad Influence and Hand That Rocks the Cradle. Do you guys, were you guys across that genre? Did you have a favorite yuppie in peril movie? Mm. I mean, didn't it start with Straw Dogs? Yeah, I mean that's a good that's a good shout because yeah. I wondered about what would be the beginning. I was thinking sort of Fatal Attraction in that in that era was yeah, maybe yeah, the one. Yeah, but, you, true, but true. you're right, Straw Dogs, Straw Dogs, because he was well, he's like an accountant in that or something. Is he just Dustin yeah. Hoffman? He's very sort of it's similar. Actually, it's a great comp because that's kind of what goes on with the Strathern arc in this movie. It's sort of yes. the emasculated 
quote unquote beta oh, yeah. male yeah. Uh, intellectual forced is is forced to sort of tap into his ca- primal caveman self because of, to defend the family to some extent. So that's just fascinating. But with the greatest comp. respect to a Sam Peckinpah, I think Curtis Hansen actually likes women. Um, <laughs> so, so if you asked yourself the question, <laughs> what if someone who liked women made straw dogs? You get the River Wild kind of, yeah. Love that, yeah. It, well, it even- was such a short-lived genre though as well. It was kind of, kind of encapsulated that early 90s vibe. It was just Pacific Heights. Malice. Lawful entry. Malice. Malice. Banger. Single white female. You know, there were so many in such a short period of time. And to me, this this fits into that classic mold, but it kind of expands it. And the other movie that this reminded me of a lot was Cliffhanger, mm. right? It's sort of the yes. open air prison, mm. you know, um, it's con- it's sort of you're expansive, but it's contained because you can't, it's, it's so foreboding, you can't escape. And ruthless thieves forcing trained guides to help them, you know, with their with their mission kind of thing. It sort of had a lot of that stuff in there as well. It also, you know, to expand outside the yuppies and peril thing, I think what I kept thinking about in this movie is in the scenes particularly, because the strongest thing about this movie is the divorce drama at the core of it, right? And I think it's hard to forget Kramer versus Kramer when you're yeah, watching Kramer this movie. Kramer versus River, yeah. Kramer yeah. versus River, very good. But just this like, <laughs> you know, Meryl kind of doing something that she's infamous for, famous, not infamous, but famous for, and applying it to this action movie template. And like, you know, divorce dramas obviously predate or Die Hard and the fact that this is like Die Hard's kind of a divorce drama with act, with with an action, you know, top line. Like this follows some of that as well. And the other thing that I thought about while watching this movie, the other film that I thought about was the sort of family adventure drama. Yeah. Like, the most, you know, going all the way back to Swiss Family Robinson, right? Which is like, was like a big rewatch in my house, the one, the old one. But I thought a lot about, um, and somewhat was distracted by how homeward bound this felt when the dog is by itself on the river and kind of like running along. And it's the only thing that sort of pierced the framework for me of this movie is I was kind of like, oh, the dog is... um, the dog is, I mean, dogs are smart, and but but it felt a little like if, of a stretch when the dog sees them and he's following along the river. Like that was one of those moments where it's like the family drama of it kind of like works. It doesn't quite as work as well with the like pretty intense action movie playing out on the boat to have the dog running along. But then when Strathairn gets separated from them, it it really starts to cook and it and it and it and it works really really well in that area. But there's like a whole bunch of different connections that this movie brings together, whether it's, you know, the yuppies in peril or the divorce drama or even things that are happening around this time in terms of like children's entertainment. And not being afraid. I mean, especially it's the casting too, right? Of um, young uh, Joseph Mazzello. It's like, we love to see this kid, poor Timmy from Jurassic Park, get thrown into really hairy situations where he almost dies. And we just really enjoy, like back in the nineties, we enjoyed watching kids be threatened with guns and death and it was fine. It was okay. But now we would just never see anything that is remotely like that. So the that's movie that's what... like that a lot is the fan, where the kid, the kid in the yeah. in Tony Scott's the fan is like absolutely put through the ringer. Yes, you know, to to the point it's like really uncomfortable to watch. And I love that movie. But you're right; it was like that was part of the just the tapestry of '90s action cinema. Yeah. Last Boy Scout With, too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Every Shane Black movie usually has like yeah. some sort of uh, you know preteen or you know young kid in in, in jeopardy. Um, yeah. Well, what do you think about, well, I had a question. I just wanted to pin you down, Blake, about Curtis Hansen. Cause you know, you, you say you're a big fan of his and as we're talking about, he's had a somewhat of an eclectic filmography and he worked on a bunch of stuff before he was directing. There were some pretty interesting, uh, credits. What's your take on him? The 1987 movie. Uh, so I watched this. This is really to sort of like, we've gone from 90s videos to pandemic film clubs. Um, I, I have a group of friends, really great bunch of writers and 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 film uh, film critics and stuff like that. And we, we, we sort of programmed a series of movies we would watch on a weekly basis and catch up and talk about them. And one of the movies that had a big impact on me was a, a blind spot for me, which was Curtis Hansen's The Bedroom Window from 1987. Yes. Which, and, um, you know, Curtis Hansen at that time was sort of a... I don't know, like a Hitchcocky kind of al- acolyte mm-hmm. guy working in neo noir and noir adjacent films, and 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 that obviously prepared him for what is his 
masterpiece and defi- career defining film of LA Confidential because that movie is just uh, unfathomably great. And then he kind of bounces around. I think he, I think people just don't know what the hell that they want to do with him, um, really. Um, but he's he's you know he's got. He's, you know, he wrote Never Cry Wolf and White Dog, Silent Partner. So he's kind of got a noir brain and he's very much that Hitchcock acolyte. So I think, while I don't think like pound for pound, every one of his movies is really good. The ones that feel the most true to his voice that have that kind of noir, crime, Hitchcock, classic Hollywood feel all work like incredibly well. And if this was a movie about a family that was being ho- held hostage in an apartment, it would be a noir. And if it mm. was, and now that it's on a river, it, it has a whole action element, which, you know, significantly increases um, the stakes of like, as a director, how you tell that story because it's so incredible. But yeah, I, I find the more, no- the more in touch with noir he is, the better he is. And so for me, like in his, in, in that, in his canon, I can watch LA Confidential and the Bedroom Window and the River Wild, like all day. All day. Like he's got three stone cold, like movies that I just classics in my opinion. And yeah, so he's always kind of there. And then, yeah, after 97, that incredible year where it's like LA Confidential and all those other movies going up against each other and it misses out on the big awards, but it gets nominated for everything. I think people just wanted to throw money at him to do these more gigantic things, but I think he's a vastly more technical um, and formally apt filmmaker than they gave him credit for and a bit of a technician with screenplays um, because, you know, if you said go and adapt LA Confidential, uh, these days people, you know, much like my great friend Jordan Harper would be like, well, no, I need a TV series because that book yeah. is a tome. It is so big and he does such a magnificent job of like making a movie out of it, like a, that does. Oh, that it's has incredible. All the bits, has all the bits that you absolutely need to tell that story and doesn't feel like it's missing anything if you love the book. And I think that that's a, that's incredible. There was like a moment, I I mean, this came up when they, with an interview with Brian Hegeland, Helgeland, where he said that uh, they were close to making a a deadly confidential series with Chadwick Boseman that would take place like 30 years later with Pierce and Russell Crowe attached. And it just never happened. And it's like, Oh, it's such a shame. That would have been, that would have been yeah, something else. Might have been. I think it's interesting also, you know, I remember when 8 Mile came out and like I was a, I remember seeing LA Confidential with my dad in the movie theater and he was almost knocked over by it. Like I, he had such a big reaction to that movie that I was like, I have two memories of LA Confidential and him, him seeing LA Confidential and being like, wow. And also him seeing Snake Eyes. He was like ahead of the curve on Snake <laughs> Eyes. He was like, Snake Eyes is genius. But when he's on, he's we were, on the Bill. He's on the Bill Get a Beer train. Yeah, my dad. My dad and Bill would. Yeah, would get along. I was actually <laughs> editing our episode of Bill Get, or Bill would be out by this point. And there's a point where he advocates for Jingle All the Way, starring Arnold Schwarzenegger, and that's why we love that man. Bill Get must he, be protected at all costs. Uh, all costs. He's, he's our, he's all our costs. greatest living dad <laughs> film fan. Um, so. He, Eight Mile came on and I like the preview and I, I was like directed by Curtis Hansen. Yeah. And then he made In Her Shoes and like, you know, he has this run after where he sort of becomes a journeyman filmmaker, right? Yeah. And like he's, he can kind of do anything and, you know, some things are more successful than others. I think you're very apt in, to come back to your point earlier of describing this as like a three and a half star banger because yeah. like it isn't trying to do too much. It's runtime is an hour and 42 minutes. And, you know, maybe Phil, this is the opportunity to to jump into our section on the heroine slash the lady, because I think the opening scene of this movie is a perfect encapsulation of what like a journeyman director can do because there's not nine pages of backstory. We kind of, we learn later on in the film that she teaches at a school for the deaf, right? But in this moment, she's just on the Charles River. I have to do it. And she's, <laughs> and she's just on the boat. And like, you see her be, like you see her grit and determination to push through whatever, whatever strain she's experienced on the boat. And then it opens up to this massive shot of Boston, which, you know, has recovered from Tommy Lee Jones's bombing campaign a few months earlier. And his accent. And his accent. <laughs> Yep. And you're just like, this is how you establish a character when you have an hour and 42 minutes, uh, for hour and 42 minute movie to do it in the same way that he establishes Russell Crowe staring at the window uh, of the woman being a- abused in L.A. Confidential and the rage in his face. Like, this is a guy who can tell you who a character is, especially a character like this, in 30 seconds. And it helps if you have the greatest screen 
actor <laughs> ever, right? Like in, in a lead role um, in an action movie. I mean, the I don't think we can understate the, how significant this is. If we move on to our section uh, about the heroine of this of this film with Meryl Streep as as Gail, it really is. You know, I'm, I'm, it was going to be so interesting when we talk to our uh, other special guest about this. Whether there was any sense on the on the set of like, is this do, do people realize the magnitude of what this means for the action genre to some extent? Because we've seen these are the we've started to see the tide turn in the last few last really in the last year um, with female empowerment in action movies with characters like Annie in Speed, played by Sandra Bullock, um, Helen Tasker, played by Jamie Lee Curtis in True Lies, is a little more complicated, but still an incredible uh, performance from Jamie Lee Curtis um, in, you know, and she's right in the, in the forefront of a lot of that movie doing incredible work. And, but this is the first one. And where, stunts. She, yeah. Cameron yeah. hangs I mean, her out of a plane. Uh, out wild. Of a amazing. Bless his but amazing. This is the first above the title giant movie star playing a lead role in, in, in a movie that we, that we've covered. And I was trying to think like, who else would have been around at this time? You had Bridget Fonda in, Point of No Return, which was the remake of La Femme mm -hmm. Nikita. I get. I don't know if like on another sort of tier of it, Cynthia Rothrock is probably doing her thing at this time. But can I'm, I was ask you both as action film aficionados, is this the first old guy action movie that was with a woman? You know, because we went through that phase of yeah, like the Liam, sort of Liam Neeson. Neeson. Yeah, and, kind of, I and love everyone's this. like, oh, old guy action. And I'm like, this is the first like not in her prime, like mum action. Well, by Hollywood standards. By Hollywood it's interesting standards. you bring that up yes, yes. also because by Hollywood standards, one thing that Bilga brought up on our True Lies episode is that one of the things that he loved about True Lies is Jamie Lee Curtis is older for a leading yes. lady in a movie in that film. She's 36. And like, yeah. you know, he, the fact that Cameron kind of like, it's not like Cameron cast a 22-year-old to be opposite no. a 45-year-old Arnold Schwarzenegger. Like it's largely, you know, comparatively to most things, age appropriate. But yeah, Meryl's 45. Yeah, Meryl movie. Streep's prime was between birth and now. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? I was like, about to say, she like, has what an are you limiting this to? Yeah. Prime. You know right. what I mean? Like she, 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 I don't. She's been exceptional at every single phase of her career. But I, I think you're right that it, that it is a, a sort of she. I mean, that's the whole backstory of the character. She, she was, she ran the gauntlet, which is this much uh, vaunted um, section of the river when she was 18 and crazy and blah, 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 to your Die Hard with a Vengeance comp. You know, she's sort of done it before. Now she's sort of, she feels like she's not quite got it in her in quite the same way. So I love that um, angle. I think it's totally, uh, it's totally on point, but it really is hugely significant, not just the fact that it's a female um you know, lead in an, in an action, in an action movie, but also the significance of an, of an actress, of her stature, of her prestige being attracted to the action genre. We've just sort of seen this with people like Jeff Bridges, you know, uh, just doing blown away and not someone who had traditionally done, done these kind of popcorn movies, but the action genre is now becoming so popular that actors that wouldn't necessarily think about it are, are being drawn towards it. So I think it's hugely significant, but what do we think? Uh, in, well, to be clear from that, this is also a great middle age movie. This is a great movie about being in middle age, about being yes. a parent, about the compromises and like challenges of being a parent and, and all this stuff, you know, there's some really, one of the things I love about the movie is that, she's a badass, but she's also like, she has a line where she's like, I'm the mother, I'm on everyone's side. Like there's a yeah, real attempt to make her feel like a real person before she is this, essentially and can I say, a And I say this with the deepest level of respect. There's nothing hotter to me than a hot mom. And Meryl is so hot in this yeah, movie. It's out, of, con it's, it's, it's out of control. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. really, I'm, I'm the worst cretinous movie voyeuristic viewer with hot mums like you take it keep your 18 year olds i you don't want to hear about it that says hot mom club it's a it's a, it's <laughs> it's a new show wear. it's a new show i'm pitching to the boys after we record <laughs> um, but no i i just Mer meryl also her beauty and her power and her strength all that stuff makes her so attractive and there's not there's not the sarah connor terminator 2 judgment day i have to masculate myself in order to I guess, convince people that I'm the action hero. It's rather that the power comes from, you know, the, the power comes from her ability to navigate emotional situations with people who are less emotionally, uh, you know, um, um, uh, 
have a less emotional intelligence than she does because she's vastly sharper um, with that. And yeah, she's so, that's what I think it comes from. It's like strength and beauty. And she just, there's something, there's the balance that she strikes between determination and tenderness in this movie that is just makes her so attractive in every possible way. And obviously they do play with that, her, you know, her, her level of attraction and, in Kevin Bacon's inherent creepiness. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, like I think that that's, that's something that she's able to do and that's why she's the perfect protagonist for this movie is because she's able to chart that course um, and she's literally charting the course for the whole movie and you, you're on her ride and, and and how everyone is interacting with her is informs how much of your experience is, uh, you know, good, bad, you know, emotional, heightened, you know, thrilling. It's, it's, it's really, it's so underrated because it's hard because there's all of the, the elements that she's dealing with and every single scene and every single day of this shoot, I imagine would have been um, pretty, pretty intense. You know, one of the things that I've been thinking about with Meryl Streep and, and when I'm looking at it with this movie in particular is just, there's something about her acting style that it's, it's, it's so deceptive in a way because it, it's like. You never, her genius is the fact that you never even think for a second that she's acting, if that, if that makes sense. Yeah. She's, it seems so effortless that you absolutely believe every single thing that mm. she's doing, whether it's the action stuff, which I'm sure she, you know, she trained extensively for and does a lot of her own stunts and all of that type of stuff, or whether it's the more emotional scenes. She's just so truthful in every single thing that she does that you almost you forget that she's acting you for, you know other movie stars might have more of a a sense of their personality um comes through you know oh this is x actor doing x role and it's fun to watch the performance there's something about her style that is so naturalistic um that well she kind of comes sucks between, you in one of the things you know? that's interesting is she kind of starts out in the era of the much more male dominated movie star you know it wasn't until you know at this point obviously she's really celebrated but like she comes out of being an actor first right whereas schwarzenegger who we talked about on you know a recent episode and even ford their careers get defined early by these iconic movie star roles you know ford gets defined by indiana jones and um harrison and han solo Schwarzenegger gets defined by Terminator. They have a certain thing that they do. Meryl, mm -hmm. especially at this stage, is kind of a chameleon. She mm -hmm. does a whole bunch of different things, but you do know that everything is like really close to the bone. I mean, the Kramer versus Kramer comp is not unrelated to this movie because what Curtis Hansen does is he casts two great actors. Well, a lot of great actors, but for the marriage, <laughs> he casts two people who are appropriate cast against one another who feel like they've been married for a long time who are real actors first um before movie stars and and i think it makes a huge difference because she's able to disappear into a part i mean like exactly Meryl streep is exactly. so famous That's but you can also i was trying to make kind yeah. of forget she's meryl how she streep. disappears into it you don't think you're watching meryl streep you think you're watching gail you know to i, I know that might sound like an, an an obvious thing but i guess she just doesn't she yeah she's just able to um, as you say, in that chameleonic way, become this character, whichever that character is, not X movie star playing a, uh, a skilled raftswoman. You know what and I mean? She it's just, also, it's just feels like real life, but And also bigger. She, she has a skill, which is some actors act so well that they destroy actors around them. Like mm. they absolutely, like they like. It's like you, know, you and podcasting. It, oh, shush. Um, I was just going to say, Brand, like Brando on the waterfront is the main one where it's like, he's mm -hmm. doing something that is different to every other human in this cast. And you're like, this is different. They're not the, they're almost not the same species. Whereas Meryl is effortlessly good in everything from something like, even like the Devil Wears Prada, where she's fantastic, super mm -hmm. big popcorn fun, another three star. She's incredible banger. in that movie. She's incredible. She's so good. She's just yeah. good, but everyone around her doesn't get dwarfed by her. They kind of all like they, they up their game. That's my metric of success of great emerging actors, or like whether you say someone's great. It's like I don't care about the movies where they're great by themselves. I care about the movies where they're against a phenomenal, huge movie star. And they hold their own, you know, like, uh, um, obviously why I think Val Kilmer was one of the greatest of his generation is because he can stand toe to toe with De Niro in heat and 
Have dudes. you ever talked about Heat? I don't know if that's no, ever come up. No, like, no it... never, n- never. It's a movie you really wanted to podcast. About. <laughs> it's really <laughs> just, I Have just. Have you seen other Michael Mann films? Where are you on uh, his filmography? <sighs> A lot of blind spots. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, uh, yeah, but that's that for me. But that's why I say she's marvelous is because she's not smashing people out of the scene. She's yeah. she's doing all of the stuff and is effortlessly complex. She's working her instrument, which is her face, so much better than, like, everyone. That if you just, like, freeze-framed or had, like, you know, those sporting slow-mo cams when they do those cool replays in, like, tennis and stuff like that, like, slow motion, you know, in Australia it's rugby league, so, like, players diving for the try line to score. Like, if you watched all the stuff she's doing, all the business she's working on, it, like, she makes everyone look like an amateur, but she but but she lifts them up at the same time. She's not showy, I think was yeah, the point not I was showy, trying to yeah. make. She's yeah, able to be it. a magnetic movie star and still be subtle. Yeah. I... This feels to me like a good opportunity to start talking about David Strathern because oh. one of the things, um, hubba hubba, one of the things that um, <laughs> really happened to me watching this movie as, you know, I saw- I was Tell us more out. about what happened to you while you were watching. <laughs> Where's this going? Mm. <laughs> I was 12. I was 12 when this movie came out, 13, something like that. Don't really remember. I maybe had seen it once in the intervening time. And now I'm watching it as a 40-year-old man- with two kids who married someone much braver than he is. And someone who, you know, like I, that's just a fact for it. And who has more confidence as a parent than I do, who has is sort of effortlessly able to manage um, like a baby screaming and a five-year-old being demanding. And like, while I'm like trying to cook eggs in the morning and I'm like, <laughs> and I think, this movie is as she's so steadfast and sort of like her character arc is that she, she sort of has to, I mean, she kind of has to become a killer, right? She's a protector at the beginning of the movie, but by the end of the film, she has to be able to kill to protect. It's, it's like, it's sort of a really powerful and simple arc that she goes on. But this movie is just as much about like male insecurity and male ego and, kind of there's that moment when he's like i just wanted you to be proud of me again david strathern is uh, as tom yeah. and it's like man if you are a man who often feels in my case rightfully so <laughs> inferior <laughs> to your partner's ability to like take the world in and figure it out and, and not get caught up in like the bullshit of your job and your career and all these things like this movie hits man and because he so gives in to being the beta character when he needs to be in this story and like david strathern is so he's not afraid of, of of he's so unvarnished in this role and like even when he shows up after you know missing the the initial flight and decides to show up he's st- still kind of like uh this guy like nobody really likes him least of all his son and joseph Mazzello is incredible as like a kind of anxious kid who's worried about his parents marriage right like the fact and that- the 90s does no, does you no favors for when you turn up and you've got gigantic oversized pleated pants <laughs> and um, a tie that just goes back to Boston it's so yeah, long it goes tie back to Boston so <laughs> long you're like everyone looks like they're insecure in those clothes like everyone looks like they're wearing their dad's suit it's no, uh, absolutely you, it's and absolutely I blame true. I blame the Chicago Bulls I blame <laughs> the Chicago Bulls I blame Michael Jordan uh, for oversized suits that somehow Though, those I will say striking a, men all got away with, and yeah. As a recovering man who was uh, dressed in the '90s by Boston parents, the suit that is too large for you is is a trope. It's part okay. of being raised. Sorry, there, is that it's you're? A, it's no, a, it's a, it's I don't take it personally. I don't take it personally. Slim for for me now. I'll tell you that much. But the thing about Strathern's Tom in this movie is that if you've ever been a parent you know what it's like to be the one that has to say no and to be the not cool one. Like, you know, as a kid who would very easily get infatuated with dudes that I thought were cool, it's very relatable the way that Mazzello, who's this sort of anxious, are my parents going to get divorced kid who I can relate to as well, when he meets like a, a cool father figure and he's like, that's what I want in a father. But really what you need in reality is someone who's like guiding you and, you know, helping you make decisions. Like the moment... When Kit Bacon, who does it on purpose because he's such a shit, gives him two hundred dollars and they have to refuse him, it's it's so it's so powerful because he does it on purpose. He does it to sow division between you know the his parent him and his father because he he wants control over the situation. It's it's like 
And if as a parent, whenever you have to be like, you can't do that, cut it out. Like whenever you're like, we have to leave, you know, the kid's having a great time at a party. And you're like, no, we got to go now. And you're like, you know, trying to get them out of the room without the temper tantrum and all these things. And like having to be the villain because that's part of life. It's so relatable. Yeah. As a, as a, as a parent. hundred percent. And I, you haven't quite gotten there, Liam, where I've got the six year old and now I've started to say, this is not a negotiation. Three weeks away, buddy. Yeah, you're, you're, you're not far. But I'm like, yeah, my daughter's nearly seven. I'm like, this is not a negotiation. Can we, Dad, we're going in five minutes. Dad, can we go in 10? No, we can go right now. What? This is not a negotiation. We're going in five minutes. Okay, Dad, because I get to be the one that has to play hardball, but that's because I know that that's the role that I fit Yeah. better <laughs> because my wife is the great, like, I can manage yeah. The emotions and stuff. And sometimes there needs to be a, we're doing this. And yeah, like, and you're so right about, that's what's so cool about the baking thing. It's control, but it's so great and it's smart and it's wily because it's like, how do I get one more person that I can influence on this trip? Mm-hmm. One more um, uh, variable in this situation under my control and with a kid, money man. Like you give her like a small kid hundreds of dollars and let them touch something dangerous. It's like, wow, don't, and give them a secret. Don't tell them. And that's just like, all that stuff is so hyper manipulative and crazy that you're like, oh my God, that is, you know, really smart writing, um, as well as just terrific perform performances all around. Well, should we move into our section then about the villain, um, which is Kevin Bacon as Wade, because yeah, I, I, to me, he was a great example of the Gruber archetype of the charming monster. Yes. You know, um, so smart, sort of a shapeshifter as well, how he was, a- how he was able to uh, pretend to be compassionate as the circumstance dictates, you know, for, for whatever his objective is. And Kevin Bacon being such an incredible actor that by the end, that end scene where he's trying to convince Meryl Streep not to shoot him, you actually, I don't know about you guys, but I actually found myself oh, he's amazing. being so bel- yeah. bel- taken in Gail. by Wade's performance. Oh, I'm, geez, you know, I'm sorry, Gail. He's like, he's so convincing in that scene. And obviously it's the character that's acting as well as, you know, so it's a layer on a layer. Again, going back to Rickman, like I think of Rickman because of the scene where he's pretending to be the hostage and, you know, how he's able to adapt according to circumstances for whatever his ultimate agenda is. So again, obviously there's not too much, There's you might think they're, they're sort of um, apples and oranges, you know, on face value, but there's definitely some, some echoes there. And also the fact, but what it does have differently to this point about, um, which again, I think goes back to things like Ham That Rocks the Cradle, where a sexually threatening figure comes into this family and presses on any fissures that are that are there, right? Because there's a, yeah. there's a definite... Um, Wade is an alpha male. David Strathairn's character is is not, um, and it gets kind of primal. He smells blood in the water a little bit, and and it, that adds this really interesting dimension to the way that the whole thriller plot. Um, but plays also, can't, out. we can't forget about Terry because he plays that other dynamic as well as like the the henchman who's blundering almost as well. Mm-hmm. Like, so it's like, it's, it starts out where it's like, you've got these two menacing figures, John C. Riley, obviously much bigger, physically imposing, makes sense, but he's also like a bit of a dope. And so then Wade's cruelty to his own ally as well helps you inform like when Meryl takes the shot, I, I'm, I'm more Marvel at Kevin Bacon's acting in that moment now, but I'm like, shoot his ass, man. Kill him, kill yeah. that shoot motherfucker. his kill him. ass. He sucks. He is, he's a snake. He is going to eat you if you like show any compassion because that's his whole his whole game. And and so it's that it's that like affable, blundering, I don't know what I'm doing attitude that like lures them in and gives them that comfort before he starts to manipulate. And you know, um, and and you can't forget about William Luckings Frank, who is the the shot. <laughs> overweight, bloated, drunken, you know, sketchy looking guy who's with him at the beginning who then just disappears. Um, and the, and dog, the dog finds, finds his body, yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. You hear a fly buzzing in that yeah. shot, where, which is re- it's great. It's really great because you never actually, I don't think, see his no, body you don't necessarily. See it. It's just but the, if you're paying the attention, inference or a, a, pile, yeah, it, a pile of like uh, trees, leaves have been sort of over him and there's something going on, but you don't actually see his body, no. You know, there's two things this movie does too that feel like, really kind of ahead of their time. Well, there's a bunch of things, but one thing that feels really ahead of its time is the 
is the pure gaslighting. Like he's such a yes. gaslighting piece oh, of shit. And great. we have a, we have a word that we use much more commonly for that than we did before. And the other thing is the moment with Benjamin Bratt where it's like a, he's racist. He's a outright oh, yeah. microaggressive. Yeah. It's yeah. not a microaggressive, it's an aggression about like, you know, be how hard it is to be, what does he say? Black or Mexican in America. Yeah. And it's just yeah. like, it hangs there. And it's like, it feels very like that's, there's villain. This is like something a villain would do now in a movie, and and the movie kind yeah. of well feels like it's, there's it's a the whole... same as like I I voted for Obama twice. Like that's this movie's <laughs> right. like line from no. For, you know, I believe it's like... he's he, it's a Native American aggression. Yeah. He yeah. he. Ben, I didn't real ben, Benjamin Bratz. I believe I think he's Peruvian. I want to get all all. I would like to check that and get that correct. Um, he's played ver characters with various different um ethnicities. Yeah, but he's, there's a he's whole... from Lima. He's, he's right. From okay. So I was yeah. okay. So good. So there's a whole Native American, um, you know, element to the tapestry of this movie, right? Because they talk about going on a vision quest. They yeah. talk about um, some of the Native American, um, uh, like the, the, they use smoke signals at one point. They use they use um, you know sign language and and some sort of symbols and st symbols and stuff that were all, that are on the rocks. There is a sense of American history and the dark, perhaps the dark side of that. It's all, it's sort of all part of the stew here. And that scene with Benjamin Bratt, who's brilliant in the movie, um, in a small part, fantastic, fantastic so role awful. as the you ranger. Think, you love him so much in the Absolutely. brief time that you see him and then he's, mm -hmm. yeah, he's gone. He's got such light as an actor, you know, Benjamin Bratt, and instantly just so likable. And this was an era, he's, he's actually three-peating on the show because yeah, we've had Demolition, Demolition Man, Man where well, he's yeah. also... Light and charming, and then clear and present danger, where he's also very likable. Um, he just has that, he, he has a kind of luminosity to him that's instantly appealing. And when Wade kills him, it, there is something deeper there about because he Wade calls himself white trash yeah. at one point, and there's some, there's right. something that cuts deeper than just I'm evil. I think he's actually symbolizing something bigger. Well, there's uh, also the whole idea of like environmental conservation. And at one point in the movie, Meryl Streep is like, we have to protect. It's like, I actually wrote down the line because there was something that intrigued me about it. But she essentially says something like, you know, we have to pre prevent this place from getting pollu polluted yes. and ruined, right? So like there is this sort of cons conservation of nature and the natural world and and there thereby the, the, the you know, and evil Native mankind, history. you know, toxifying it. You know, right. I mean, again, to use a more common phrase you were just saying about gaslighting, Wade represents toxic masculinity, you know, to yeah. some extent. But so does um, so it's very ahead to of a certain time. extent. Like they, they make him complicate. It's very good. Like it's very, these guys are like, they're both. Yeah, because he relegates her. That's the thing. He right. relegates her to just being a mother. And when you see how do, like determined and dominant and how holistic she is as an individual, um, it's. It, when he's just like, yeah, I'm going to work late and you're going to have to deal with the kids. Yeah. And she's like, oh, like again, like, you know, it's, and that's the other deeply relatable thing in a relationship. It's like, you got to be a good team, man. That's the only thing that you could, you have to be. And if he's letting down his side of the bargain, it makes it really tough. That's like, the lesson they learn, isn't yeah. it? You know, ultimately is they have to work as a team for the good of the family, well, I think which is just a great underlying message. Of this to film. your point, we were talking before, it's like, you know, you learn how to do things in a marriage, right? Like some one person might have to be the like hardliner who's like, let's, we're getting out of here now. And one person has to figure <laughs> out how to be more like in the moment appeasing or like one per like I, there's certain things with the kids where I'm like, I won't do that, but I'll do the other thing because I know <laughs> that I won't lose my fucking mind if I do the other thing, right? So it's like, it's about like, it's almost like a uh, wrestling. It well, it's a lot like wrestling and tag teaming. And like you tag out at some point, you're like, I'm not the right person for this, this moment. And he's just kind of tagged out. At the yeah. beginning of the movie, and he has to. Kind and then of when come he back. when he tags back in, it's like that's that, that's what's so great about Joseph Mazzella as a young kid is looking at him because kids just sort of seem like they're little like lie detectors, and he's just looking he's at him so like good. you don't you don't want to you don't want to you want to go you don't want to yeah. go you don't want to be here don't pretend that you're part of this family and that's you know that, that it's so harsh and Strathan really that's that they're barbs that that sting. A masterpiece of storytelling in this movie is the decision to sideline the younger daughter because that yes. would overcomplicate the sort of like survivalist element of it. Yes, and yes. secondly, it gives her an external motivation for getting out. Like it's not just the kid that's there. It's also the daughter waiting at yeah. the end of the line. And I think, yeah. you know, these little things that they do in this movie it's that brilliant. are so smart. It's, this movie 
fucking rules, man. <laughs> like everyone should go and see this movie if you haven't seen it. It's All right, that's fantastic. it. Let's wrap it up. Thank you, Blake. For an, this. Hour and, an hour and 42 minutes. Watch it in an evening. I even could Easy. stay awake for this one. I Easy. can't stay awake for any movies. An hour and um, 42 minutes. Phil, is now my chance to pitch my idea for, since we're talking about uh, action movie stuff, should I pitch my, my alternate idea for the climax of this movie that I think... Gold, Go what for do you it. think? So, Go for it. action in this movie. Incredible. I think the my the decision at the end to have Strethern come upon that spot where there's the giant, I don't even know what they are, structures that have... They're, they're like it looks they're like a like a police system. system. Yeah, yeah, police system might might have been like a quarry. Well, a quarry, yeah, like, exactly. Yeah. And he uses his. I would say he the fact that he's an architect was not lost on me, and the idea that he he sort of designs this thing that's going to pull the boat up and and you know give him give him the advantage. I think that sequence is really cool. It does lean a little bit into the like Home Alone family adventure of these <laughs> kinds of things. And and my theory, and I think it's an expertly staged sequence, and it's great, is that I had w- I wish that that had failed and it didn't do what it was supposed to do. And Strathern just has to jump in that boat and like really step into the role of like I'm the alpha male now. Like I almost wish. It, it wouldn't moment. have made, it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have felt, it would be like Holly beating up Hans Gruber. You mm. know, like it, we don't, we, you know, okay. like it's, 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 it's a step It's too not far. his movie. It's not right. his movie. That's true. Yeah, that, I think you guys are right. That's the only reason why, because I think if it was he, if he was the lead in it, then yes, because that's the straw dogs thing, yes. right? Yes. The, the emasculated beta male who has to, you know, is <laughs> well, like I just say sorry to overpowered, all Peckinpah fans know. about what I said earlier in this podcast. <laughs> About Pekupa? No, you're absolutely on the money. You know, it, it's it's no, there's nothing wrong with saying that. You know, you can be a you know, it's just it's just the truth. Oh no, I I, I, you know? I actually also am really not sorry. Um, because all I can uh, just like uh, the master Bill Gary, all I can be is what I love unabashedly and earnestly. Um, and uh, yeah, that's an opinion, and I still love Peck and Pie, So there you go. Two it, things can it, be true. Look, right? as dudes that dudes 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 that do a podcast about action movies. You have to compromise some of your politics and beliefs <laughs> like on a pretty regular basis to really, yeah. you know, dig into it. It's it's part of the ballgame. But I do agree with you guys. I think the, the reason they don't do that and it's logical is because it is not his movie, right? Like it's not his mm. to overcome. But, you know, I think otherwise, I think the speaking of action sequences, the moment where he's hanging on the side of the cliff and waiting for mm. the boat to go oh. around the corner is like way up there for me because well, it generates. Oh. I want to talk about that because that's that's a direct comp. Uh, to another film that uh, to First Blood, um, yes. which oh, involves yeah. a long sequence of because basically in this film you have an architect becomes John Rambo for for an entire <laughs> subplot, and it literally First Blood literally has a prolonged and very tense sequence with Stallone clinging onto the the granite mountain, and of course First Blood being one of the um, you know major influences on on Die Hard. So there is you know there's a bunch of those movies that are in that survivalist mode where this I think traces some of its lineage back to Deliverance, um, mm. Southern Comfort to some extent. Or that's more of a more of an ensemble piece and and First Blood. Um, but I think the action in this movie, I mean, it, it's it's hard to sort of separate Southern, specific Southern Comfort sequences. is like Southern Comfort for folks who haven't seen it. A fantastic Walter Hill movie, and it would be like. If every character was Wade and Terry, yes, yes, like they're every all ca- awful, they're <laughs> all the worst. <laughs> yeah. I've not seen this humanity. movie. Wow, oh eight of the God. worst human beings in the world <laughs> are, are so unlikable, and yet the film is dynamite. It's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Wow. it's a big, so it's a big examination of like, like masculine energy and um and in, in all its booth. forms and yeah, <gasps> it's unbelievable. Fred Ward. Cast. Yeah, Fred Ward. It's Phil, a great, have we ever talked about Remo Williams, movie. The Adventure Begins, and how much I love that movie? Have we talked talk about, about problematic politics in yeah, yeah, like 100%, yeah. casting in that 100%, film? But um, even though it's also, a great performance from Joel yeah. Grey, but woo, that's, a, Ooh, that's not, yeah, that is that's not appropriate. Mm-hmm. Um, the action in this movie, though, just staying to this point, because there isn't specific sequences I could necessarily extract and say, oh, what do you think of this sequence? It's almost like the whole film is uh, certainly the whole second half is like that. And the final point I was just going to make about how wonderful the action is in this film, because it's so, we've used this word a few times. To me, this is where an action movie really works is when it feels experiential. Because my abiding memory of seeing this film with my parents at the cinema on the big screen was you felt like you were going to get splashed by the water, literally. It was such an, it does such an amazing job of immersing you 
uh, in the action itself, which has got to be obviously logistically so hard to film, you know, and it's all practical, you know, um, at least as far as I can see, you know, so it, it, it's a, it's a, it works on an action movie level, even though it's sort of this combination of emotional family drama and Hitchcockian thriller, but but put on a raft in an in a dynamic action setting. But as an action, as just purely as an action film, it delivers. I mean, it's, it's exhilarating to watch, especially in the second half. Blake, do you have a favorite sequence? Oh, you don't. You can say no. It's okay. No, um, it it's hard because. There are the, the smaller moments and they, so from like a more dramatic touch, um, I love the scene where Wade is being taught to fish by Gail and what that tension is doing. I think it's just a, an mm -hmm. actor's masterclass of the tension of the movie in that instance where Gail is so like warm and, and has such a good view of humanity to a large extent that, and she's had experience with sort of dirt bags in her past that she's like, oh, he's harmless, you know, and it's sort of that yeah. interplay and I love all of that that triangulation of like insecurity this guy's dodgy but he's also hitting on my wife so I don't know whether I'm just feeling something that's not there all that sort of stuff um but but I can't get I can't get past the um some of the probably the training for the gauntlet more so than the gauntlet even itself like yeah. as in that you know you've got to do this and we're going to do this and you know you he can't be tied into the raft and all that sort of stuff. Like the, her preparing them for the magnitude of what they're about to face. And then still how, when you actually get to the gauntlet, how much they're ill prepared for it. I just love that because it's like, you're also seeing, especially in those early stages in the lead up to the, to the gauntlet where they're doing practicing little maneuvers and exercises. It's like, these guys suck. And it's going to be a miracle for Gail to get them through, which I personally, I'm like, I love that because it like, again, shows how, 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 you know, towering Gail is in that moment because she literally gets them through this hairy thing, um, um, you know, almost on her own back. Um, and Wade starts to sort of get it, get his handle on it. But, uh, you know, John C. Riley's like, ah, like he's just got that like great, like <laughs> he's so I'm, good. No, I'm, I'm never great at anything kind of vibe in this movie. And um, yeah, he's, it's really, it's fantastic. You know, one thing that you just said that I think is really great is, and this doesn't happen enough in movies anymore, is the fact that the, the hero and the villain, are, how our destinies are tied in together, right? Like they have, an, yeah. they have an exterior thing they have to do for survival. And it's outside of their relationship and it's outside of the fight. And so when they, when they do survive the rapids, like seeing the heroes and villains celebrating together is something that I feel like is lost in these yes. movies a lot of the time. And it it really works for me because it complicates. And I feel like as a kid seeing that, I was kind of like, oh, you know, as a, as a 12 year old, like the world is not black and white. It's gray. Like there are times when you need to rely on people. Um, it's the old um, scorpion and the frog type thing yeah. as well, isn't it? You know, that, yeah. like, that classic kind of parable or classic sort of fable of, you know, mu mutual survival or mutual, mutual destruction in a, you know, against ra raging nature. Um, yeah. Yeah. This movie's fucking great. I just got to say it again. Just the more we talk about it, I'm just like, this screenplay is incredible. Yeah, I didn't know it's, if you were you know, a fan, Phil. It's hard been hard oh, to tell. Oh, it's so fantastic. I love this movie so much, man. It's just wonderful. It really is great. Um, for should, we put on our, you know, should we put on our rafting gear? Is it time to get us suit up? Let's raft our, down the LA River up. to uh, the Oscars. You mean run down the river, the LA River, because there's not much water there. <laughs> yeah. Just running along the river. We did have, we had a storm recently. We might yeah. have some left. Oh, did um, we? This okay. is the Die Hard Oscars, a.k.a. the Action Movie Awards, hosted by Phil Gawthorne, noted screenwriter and podcaster. Hello. So uh, the first award is the John McClane yippee ki Award for Best Line. I have four nominees, but feel free to add any if you think of any. But the one, one I had you already said, which was, I think, a really great line, I'm on everybody's side, I'm the mother, which is kind of like... Good line. Theme stated to some extent, just 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 really really great, and it, and she does it in her throwaway way that isn't like putting a highlighter pen over it, but it's just wonderful. The, the other line that struck me was when Gail says, "You know, you don't command the river, you let the river command you," mm. which I think was also yeah. you know metaphorically pretty interesting. Wade's line: "I am a nice guy." I'm just a different kind of nice guy. It was, <laughs> Amazing. It was, pre was pretty cool That's when you think about it. very cool. And the other line that wasn't necessarily like 
so much about the line, the writing of the line, but just Meryl Streep's delivery is when she says, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you, Wade. Like, and it's way before the end of the movie. And mm. it's said with such sincerity and potency that you just know this is absolutely the God's truth, you know, and it's going to get delivered by a fucking thunderbolt at some point in this movie. I just love her line delivery of that moment. Yeah. I'm going to go with the Wade line, personally. I There's think the one Wade other, line. The, the Wade Ooh. line rules. There's one other line. Go for it. I'm going to go take a bath. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm just like, you know what? Mum and dad need some alone time on a family holiday. There's nothing more grueling almost than the gauntlet than taking two children on a holiday or even oh one God. down a river. And so the fact that they get that moment, I love that moment so much. But no, I, I love I'm going to kill you, Wade, because at that point you do have confidence that she can do it. But I love that she sticks to her conviction of like, she is compassionate. She does all this stuff, but like, I'm going to kill you, Wade. Like, like you don't believe it for like another 35 to 40 minutes that she's actually going to do it. That's my favorite line. Cause I'm going to kill you, Wade. Cause it's like, I'm going to kill like Meryl Streep saying she's going to kill Kevin Bacon. Age as well. It's, it's awesome. Yeah. It's so good. Um, the Hans Gruber Exceptional Thief Award for Stealing the Film. Mm. Uh, I have three nominees amongst this wonderful cast. Bear in mind, some of them may appear in the next category. Um, David Strathairn as Tom, Joseph Mazzello as Rourke, and Kevin Bacon as Wade. Tough category. Mm. I'm going to give it to Joseph Mazzello. The reason that I want to give it to Joseph Mazzello is I think he's like a genuinely good child actor. And I think it's pretty next level. Like his tantrums, when he, whatever you want to call them, when his outbursts are legit. Like I, 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 as all parents here, sometimes your children admit sounds and frustrations that you're like, where the fuck did that come from? And it's like, <laughs> he has, he does not give a child performance. He gives a smart, perceptive, thoughtful kind of um pre-spielbergian you know or is it the same year is it the same year as drastic park it's one year after it's one one year year after after. so but it feels like you know in in jurassic park he plays more of a spielberg-esque kid right like kind of wild-eyed and like whoa which of course makes sense for the subject matter and in this film he has this quality of like if you've ever you know, this is very personal, but if you are a child of divorce or if you come from a home with these kinds of issues, you're always a little on edge, especially if you're living in it. And it's very like real and present for you. And and his anxiety and his desire to find like a parental figure, especially with without his actual father around, is like very real and understated. And I think that if that just makes it really, really great. So I would if give it he to doesn't him. drown acting alongside John C. Riley, David Strathairn, <laughs> Meryl Streep, and Kevin Bacon, yeah. then he's a very good actor. Yeah, he's very good. That's yeah. I'll I'll, I'll go with that. I'll go with that. I, as, I, as, I, as he, I'd agree. Good. And, and yeah. I do I do love the many pronunciations of his name. It's Rourke, and then Roark, Roark, <laughs> like Kevin Bacon's like Roark, like starts like. Well, that's the oh shucks thing that Kevin it. Bacon does. Kevin, oh shucks, you know, I'm just I'm just yeah. like a normal, you know, like he's. <laughs> it's a very smart. It's a very smart <laughs> performance. Boy, you know, yeah. Phil, do you think this movie's good? Because I think this movie's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's okay. Um, it's fine. No, you, it, it's so true because it's. It, Often kids on screen can be very, it can be annoying, especially yeah. if they're being bratty or whiny as, as he is forced kids to be. Kids are annoying though. But he's not. Like we get like, to, like, so um, annoying. Hot, hot take. Kids can be super annoying. <laughs> so when I see a kid that's actually doing it and it doesn't feel like it's forced, it feels very natural. Then you're yes. like, oh, this kid's really good. Yeah, because then great. it feels like they're, attack, they're, they're, they're attacking into their own sometimes frustrations and impatience and yeah th- th- that's what i think liam's talking about the anxiety the impatience the nat- the naturalness of the outburst in the structure of the script you know really good cool um let's move on to uh the dick thornberg award for dick of the movie there's it's the one grandma. shining candidate let's be real it's the grandma, um, <laughs> the grandma. <laughs> the grandma. <laughs> who's like we, we could have so- got divorced <laughs> but we didn't want to, so we fucking stayed together. Yeah. Why um, is she English? Shout out to, I mean, I guess she's shout, English. Shout, shout out to Elizabeth Hoffman. <laughs> In Phil's head, she's just an old cockney broad. <laughs> who's just like, stay. 
stay together. <laughs> we want to stay together. I don't know what I don't know what's going on. Um, <laughs> so I've got Kevin Bacon as Wade, um, John C. Riley as Terry. Uh, their partner in crime, Frank, for dying like an arsehole. Um, and then Glenn Morshower. Check this. Your your boy Glenn Morshower uh, oh, rocking up at the end. Who's when when Joseph Mazzella saying my mom did this and my mom did that and then he and he goes what did your dad do like judgy <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what's that supposed to mean I you know f- commented on how I think this is a good screenplay that scene is not good um in my point of view because it restates what has just happened for you in the in the hour and forty two minutes of the movie and I think if the movie had just ended on him talking to the uh, Glenn Marshower and looking over at his parents who are like, you know, having a moment together without the, the you know, the, the like. He saved ever- our lives. <laughs> and they're like, oh, yeah. no oh. shit. Yeah. Yeah. It's not. I mean, again, I love the movie, but like it force fed me what I'm supposed to feel at the end. Of Do the you movie feel like doing there. a Glenn Marshower impression, by the way? Because I loved your Glenn Marshower impression in Under Siege. Me? Was, yeah. Do you remember doing that? Well, I guess we'll just see what we'll see. <laughs> But the version of it that you did was like, Mr. Robert, yeah, let me try. cut it out. What did and it sounded like do? Mason Virgin from Hannibal. It <laughs> sounds like Buffalo Bill in Silence yeah, of the Lambs. It was just, it was suitably demented. Would you have a pick? Um, would you have a pick, Blake, uh, for Dick of the Movie? Yeah, look, it's Kevin Bacon. He's yeah, it's Kevin Bacon. Dick. He's so good. He's such a dick and a gaslighter, as Liam said, because we have the parlance of our common parlance to say what that is. And yeah. Yeah, absolutely sensational. All right. I'm going is with Marco the in the house? Is Marco in the house, Liam? Is Marco in the house? Yeah, Marco's... Okay, yeah, Marco's in the house. All right. So Marco is here. We can confirm. Um, it is going to be our final category is the best death presented by Marco. No more table. <laughs> <laughs> no more Creepy table. Version. Next time you have a chance to kill someone, don't hesitate. Do you have a favorite Die Hard terrorist, Blake, from the from the squad um, there? Blake left. He was like, "I'm done." This is too no, much. no, no, no. I, lo- I love it. Um, I because of uh, a deep and abiding love of Peter Weir and all Peter Weir films. Um, my, my favorite villain uh, henchman in Die Hard is Alexander Gudenov, the famous dancer. He plays Carl. Um, he's absolutely my favorite. Also one of the stars of Witness. Um, and I love him. He's you wanna, sensational. You want to hear my Witness take very quickly? It's good. My favorite Peter Weir movie. Except for maybe Picnic at Hanging Rock. But I yeah. love Witness. It's my favorite Harrison Ford movie. Well, Mosquito yeah. Coast pretty good too. But yes, I, I made a lot of great ones, but Witness is where it's at. Anyway, um, so I, there's only really two deaths in this film. We've got Wade blowing away uh, Benjamin Bratt's Ranger Johnny and uh, Gail killing Wade. And Frank. But we don't see Well, it. Frank kind of dies uh, off screen. Off, off screen. You know? Yeah. So, uh, it's got to be Wade. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the most satisfying. The Benjamin Bratt one hurts more. It sucks. Yeah. It's, it's so cruel. Um, so if you get off on that, maybe you you might like that. But I like I, I like. Sh- I only I, had two choices. So. I, I like. I like. I like. I like Wade. I like Wade. Yeah. It, you know this. Just to speak for this one second. You know the other film. This came up. You know another one of our shows. There's a movie that sort of ruined movies for me in the best possible way. Jingle which all was the in way. The of, <laughs> in the line of fire because it was so perfect and it had such a satisfying ending in the way that Clint Eastwood you you outwitted John Malkovich when he's speaking into the the microphone and he says, "Oh, he doesn't." And Malkovich doesn't realize and he says at the end, "Oh, one more thing though, aim high." And he's tipping his hat to the snipers. I wanted every single film to end with some piece of brilliance like that when I was a kid, where, where, the, where the hero outwitted the bad guy in some, some really clever way. And this film does that in yeah. such a brilliant, brilliant way. You know, it's as you said, that was the word that I had written down. It is so satisfying. It's such a yeah. satisfying death when she finally gets weighed. So, yeah, yeah I would agree. I would agree um, as well. Should we take a quick break? Let's do it. We'll be back. We're back. All right. Last section. Oh, God. Quizzes. <laughs> That's some I do, great I, energy, I do, Liam. I do love a trivia night. Let me tell you. 
I know. I heard you had nine mojitos at one recently. Is that true? (laughs) Is this a cultural thing? Because Brits love, we love a little pub quiz. Uh, Look. Are are you guys the same? Because Phil, if you were here, like, it's like, it's the perfect excuse to hang out with your mates. And at the, the beautiful bar, respite bar, my local cocktail bar that do trivia, if you win, they pay for your bill. Yeah, Whoa. Liam. Liam's face. Yes, yes, I'm you are correct. In on this, we gotta, Phil. He's, we gotta, he, we gotta he, get, uh, we gotta get Blake over here and take him to the blue room. Yeah, for absolutely. Some, yeah, so, for so that's drink. what I mean. You, you go and you just. I do love a trivia night, and and I do love gloating when I've had nine mojitos. By the way, Blake, the bar that Phil and yes. I go to, the second bar later in the night that we go to, is John Voight's Bar in Heat. The blue room. The blue room. We live. We both Nate's live bar. down the street. We both live down the street from the Blue Room, and we're we're there Shit. pretty regularly. So we gotta next Shit. time. We gotta fly you over, man. We gotta go oh to. We God. gotta go. Yeah, sit that at doesn't the Blue tempt room. you. Nothing. <laughs> nothing will. I mean, it'll be a cold one waiting for you, mate. The perfect kind of skis. It is an incredible, oh, incredible bar. But I, we got. I will I, fit I, right in. I'll fit in like a glove. Phil, I can't believe we've never made this connection that we go yeah. to the bar in heat. Before it's, it's also in Memento. Cool. Anyway, all right, moving along, moving along, moving all right. along. All right, so um, the rules are simple, Blake. Uh, it is going to be three questions. Um, uh, you'll get one clue each if you need it. You can phone a friend, aka you can radio Al Powell, uh, and uh, you can choose whether to collaborate or compete with Mr. Billingham. Okay, um, so do I have to choose to collaborate or compete with Billingham yes. now? Yes, please. Okay, cool. Let's compete. Oh, all right. right. Let's, let's go. Compete. Okay. It's going to get my fucking ass Fingers on buzzers. <laughs> all right, let's do it. And remember, this is for the listeners at home, too. Okay. Okay. So Question number jump one. jump immediately down your throat with the answer to the question. Do you have to now. answer like Jeopardy? Because I'm not good at like... No, you just have to say them. <laughs> oh, okay, cool. Yeah, usually that it's really a... confuses the shit out of me. I'm sorry. I might be because I'm from the colonies, but I'm like, I don't know how people answer like that. I, it freaks me out. Yeah, just that does kind of mess with, that messes with my melon as well. Right. Um... Which three principal actors starred in the 2023 reimagining slash sequel entitled River Wild? Bing, 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 bing. Oh, you got it. Taryn Go Killian, Adam Brody, and Leighton Meester. Is oh my correct. God. Have you guys Jeez. seen it? You, you said no, it's I pretty seen good, it. right? It's I haven't seen it yet. Great. Okay. Great. It is it best be described as like inspired by the River Wild. Like it's a very different story. Um, but the but one of the things that was interesting in the rewatch is I was like some of the tensions of they're there like it makes like it 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 it, it, it the, the characters have a pre existing relationship and that makes it much much more heartbreaking and tragic it is yeah, I thought it was I kind of turned it on I was like oh, I'll watch ten minutes of this and I could not stop and my it was oh, so intense my out. wife my wife was like I can't I am leaving the room I can't watch this movie it's like too <laughs> too intense for her so I mean and she it was just it's really really worth seeing. All right, question number two. Meryl Streep has received an astonishing 21 Academy Award nominations and won three times. Which films did she win Oscars for? Bing, bing. I think it's Sophie's Mm -hmm. choice. Correct. The terrible Iron Lady. Correct. And... Kramer? Is correct. Yeah. Bravo, oh. sir. Bravo. Yep. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, Kramer Iron versus Lady Kramer, Sophie's Choice, hang. and the Iron Lady. Iron Lady? Never, never watched it. I'm not, as you can imagine, not really interested in the <laughs> veneration <laughs> of a certain politician. I'm not um, really interested in Margaret Thatcher. Can you <laughs> exactly. tell by my accent? <laughs> Yeah, I agree. No, but still love Meryl. Still love Meryl. Meryl Meryl rules, but she could have gotten 10 other Oscars in that 21 easily. Um, You know what movie um, she's incredible about, incredible in, that is unsung, is Steven Soderbergh's film The Laundromat, which if you Mm. have not seen it, it's excellent. Terrific in The Laundromat. It's a great movie. It is a great movie. Really great Great movie. movie. Great movie. Steven Soderbergh's just like this. Here's another great. Bing, 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 bing. That no one sees for like 10 years. I'm like, holy shit, this was awesome. And you're like, yeah. No shit. I feel like in five, ten years, people are going to be like, you know, let, we all slept on Kimmy. And I'm going to be like, not me. I watched it in a row twice, <laughs> two times in a row. <laughs> all right. So the scores are tied. 
which makes uh, the final question uh, very high stakes as we move into Convoluted Corner. Corner, corner, corner. corner. Bing, 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 the bing, most bing, tortured bing, bing, bing. trivia questions you can imagine. But now, the I have third to say, I'm assistant really... director in the river wild. <laughs> no, 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 no. This is, this is my best work. Okay, this is the best thing I've ever done in, 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 in this life or the next. Podcast, so I feel All a little... Right. Okay. Here we go. Kevin Bacon plays the villainous Wade in the river wild. Bacon would go on to appear in two similarly named films, playing two very different police detectives in both. Can you name the two Kevin Bacon movies with titular similarities to this film? Ding, ding. <sighs> one is Wild Things. Is um, correct. And... God, I don't know the other one off the top of my head. It's Mystic River. Ah, oh, Mystic is River. Is right. Damn it. <laughs> Well, we have Wild to share that one. and Mystic we River, do, we, so it's a tie. Is that my we, daughter in there? Is, is that, that my daughter, daughter in there? Oh, so, good. so good. How weird is that, though? The River Wild, Wild Things, and Mystic River. I thought that was he pretty interesting. It. He's all great right. in all um, those movies, by the way. He's so good oh, yeah. in all those movies. Mystic awesome. River is Only... banger. Yeah, Mystic River rules. Mystic River is fantastic, yeah. And, and he hangs and... dong in uh, Wild Things. Bless your heart, Kevin Bacon. <laughs> Bless your heart. <laughs> All righty, Ruth. Um, First time someone said hangs dong on the podcast. So I feel like we've, we've really, we've hit a, that's a good one. Blake, is there anything, any other final thoughts that you have? Anything you want to tell us about? Any cool shit that you're up to right now? Anything you want to This guy add? always has the coolest shit. Uh, okay. Um, really quickly, um, I just wanted to say that I've watched, f f very pertinent to this show before I do any plugs. I've seen the Die Hard with a Vengeance way more than I've seen Die Hard. Mm. Um, which, and, and that's because of that VHS thing. Like we got Die Hard with a Vengeance and I didn't have the original Die Hard on VHS for a long time. So I just want to say that. Um, so firstly, thank you for having me on the show. Thank you for indulging me on this great Curtis Hansen movie, um, uh, of which I love very much. Um, as far as plugs. Okay, here we go. Um, <laughs> Podcaster and Commander has got two more, uh, three more episodes to go. I've cut, uh, it's going to be seven episodes. Seven is Lucky Jack's uh, number, so mm -hmm. we're doing that. Um, the final episode has an interview with Peter Weir, the first he did in more than a decade <gasps> with any person. Whoa. Um, it's short, but um, I happened to get my hands on his home phone number by accident and uh, then called him. It's um, weird when that happens by accident. It's just so weird. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I got it. Um, <laughs> thank you, the Directors Guild of America, for putting Peter Weir's phone number on the front page of his profile and then swiftly taking it down after I called him. Um, <laughs> um, so uh, that's really cool. That's going to uh, conclude uh, by the end of this year. Um, so or in the next month or so, that's going to be concluded and, and we would have done that. But I will tease, I may not be done with Weir. Uh, just as I do with some other filmmakers that we cover. Um, the next one is I'm producing a fantastic audio documentary series called The Great Henson Caper, 12 episodes on the life and career of Jim Henson and all of the films and projects that he directly was involved in, not so much the Muppets that go beyond or things um, that he didn't wasn't directly involved in. Um, we're up to The Great Muppet Caper episode um, as uh, the time that we're recording, so just putting the finishing touches on that before it is released. Um, at One Heat Minute Productions is where you can find everything we do, oneheatminute.com. And towards the end of the year, uh, which will travel all the way into like early February next year, Jen Johans and I have been doing what's called the Midnight Run Through, which is 12 episodes on Midnight Run, usually featuring <gasps> dynamic duos uh, talking, uh, you know, because obviously one of the great dynamic duos of all time is uh, Charles Grodin and Robert De Niro. So we've already recorded uh, lots of episodes of that, um, which is very exciting. And uh, uh, it's 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 conversational. It's a show, but it's also um, we've been waiting for the strike to end because we have – uh, there's so many phenomenal actors mm. and things like that who are no longer with us that can't be a part of it. But um, we have a lot of great voice actor friends who are going to be recreating some of their great interviews and discussions for us as part of that show. So that's the tapestry of that. And then at One Hit Minute Productions, everything else, physical media reviews on Imprint Companion and Blues Brothers, Miami Nice, which is our flagship sort of Michael Mann show, Horny Michael Mann Modern Campfire with my amazing co-host Katie Katie. Walsh. Uh, weekly review shows on our Patreon, um, on video, which is, uh, I just one hot take. So it's tight 10 minutes on new releases. Uh, and I have 
one, two, three projects that are on the boil that I can't talk about uh, and won't and flat out actually four shit four um, that I can't announce yet because nothing has uh, nothing has uh, excel. Oh, five. Uh, yeah, a few of them haven't accelerated. He just into picked the- up two projects while he was talking, so it's just I that the list keeps about adding. Two. I forgot about two year or more long projects. Um, but yeah, so uh, lots of stuff. We we are all about insane cinematic deep dives at the biggest level. Um, and so there are other shows that come up uh, fairly infrequently um, uh, on the show and on our, on our feeds. Um, but um, there's a couple of big ones that I'm working on. And again, sort of more, more producing um, uh, than, than hosting on some of them, but others hosting. Um, so yeah, I'm that, that's what I do. I only know how to do what I do, which is obsessively and uh, scrutinize the living daylights out of things that I love. And that's what we do on one heat minute and one heat minute productions. Well, Fantastic. you remain a legend and a great guy and a oh, good friend, and, and I love you. Oh, and thank you. I love for you too, man. You're the best. I'll take I'll take I'll f- take those nice compliments. There. You're the best. Um, thanks I'll take for the nice this. ones about my personality, and but not my work. Uh, that, that that's fine. <laughs> thanks for doing this, man. Hey, thank you, Phil. It's been awesome. Thank you, Mister Blake Howard. What a guy. That was great. That was great. Yeah. Um, what a he, coup for us, uh, you know, for, to get Blake on. His insights were fantastic. Um, so much die to Die Hard say. with a Vengeance. More of a Die Hard with a Vengeance movie than Really than I, interesting than take. And yeah, yeah, loved his assessment of Curtis Hansen's career as someone who kind of walked the line between being somewhat of an auteur and somewhat of a journeyman and walked that line very skillfully and made a number of extraordinary films and was a really beloved figure. Uh, here in here in Hollywood, may he rest in peace, and his memory and his works are, are will be cherished forever. Yeah, great artist. Um, Die Hard OAB on Twitter. That's where you can find us. That's where it's all happening. That's, I mean, all it, of it. Sh- all of it. it sh- X.com. It's all happening there. <laughs> popping off. Uh, I'm at Liam G. Billingham on Twitter. You can email us, dieHardOAB at gmail.com. Phil. Yeah, uh, you're tweeting right now. Actually, I am never not about tweeting. Your... I'm just like oh, yeah, I'm, a a, constant... I'm an ex fiend. Phil Bot, Phil Bot is just on there tweeting all the time. <laughs> yeah. Now, where can we find you on Twitter these days? At Philip Gawthorn. Interact with me. I need to. I need to say something. You know, every time I think of saying something, I'm like, oh no, no, no one will care. Maybe we'll try to think of some live tweet to do in the new year, so we can sort of engage the folks. That's we should chat about idea. what that might be. It is. Yeah, at us and tell us what you want us to live tweet. That's what we uh, should do. Next time on the show, our Christmas special. Mm-hmm. I can't believe I'm saying what I'm about to say, but you maybe in the past have been asked, is Die Hard a Christmas movie? Yes, it is. Obviously. What we're going to ask you, with the help of Paul Shear returning to the podcast, is, is Home Alone a Die Hard movie? That's right. Mind blown. I made my family disappear. So that's going to be our our Christmas gift to you, hopefully. Uh, coming up um, on our next episode, we are doing a, we're breaking the format a little bit and we're going to do a Christmas bonus special and we're going to do Home Alone. We'll be back next time with the Wet Bandits. Die Hard on a Blank is a podcast created and hosted by Philip Gawthorne. Liam Billingham co-hosts and produces the show. Mike Mayer and Michael Sugar are the executive producers. Find us on Twitter and Instagram at Die Hard OAB. Rate, review, follow the show wherever you get your podcasts. Most importantly, tell your movie podcast loving friends about Die Hard on a Blank. Special thanks to Suki Chu. See you next time on Die Hard on a blank.